every once in a while I get stuck on a topic and I come back to it over and over again and I always as I sat down to write and realize wow this sermon sounds a lot like another one I've preached I always wonder if people are going to get tired of it and then this last January when I was at Remind and Renew with Phillips I listened to a man who served the same church for 33 years say that when they called him to that church he told them and you all have heard me say this before he told them he only had one sermon when they got that right he'd preach a second one so forgive me if I dwell on a topic every now and then clearly we're not getting something and we need to work on it a little bit a couple of weeks ago I shared my belief that we must keep going we must keep growing our faith there is no standing still in our faith one of my favorite writers said that the moment we stop growing we are dying it is not a moment of standing still or treading water as Jim and I discussed one day we must keep doing the hard work of Scripture, of dwelling in God, of praying, of seeking God's face every single day. This is how we continue to grow as Christians. This is how we continue to seek God as God continues to reveal God's self to us. This is how we continue to deepen our understanding of Scripture, deepen our relationship with God, Jesus but it is also how we deepen our relationship with this thing we call the church. Again, as I said last week, God is not done with us. God is constantly working on each and every one of us, drawing us in to God's presence. The only question, as I left you with last week, is are we going to listen? Are we going to let God continue God's revelation in our lives? lives this week I want to continue along that theme but from a little different angle my faith and the promises of Jesus tell us that nothing can take us out of Jesus' hand John 10 28 through 30 I give them eternal life and they shall never perish no one shall snatch them out of my hand my father has given them to me and God is greater than all. No one shall snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. What goes hand in hand with this promise and our focus for today is that we cannot hide from God. This is another one of those hard lessons that we have to learn as Christians. God knows us, understands us, loves us beyond all measure this is another promise that's found in Psalms 139 actually it's found throughout the Gospels and throughout the, the Bible as a whole but Psalms 139 flat out says it oh Lord you have searched me and know me you know when I sit down when I rise up you discern my thoughts from afar you search out my path my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high, and I cannot attain it. God knows us better than we can know ourselves. God knows us before we speak, before we are rude, before we are mean, before we praise, before we pray. And yet, God loves us anyway. So I've been dwelling in the book of Hebrews here lately. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 13 and 15 says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of God. To the eyes of He who we must give account. 
Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet is without sin. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I spent a lot of time this week with a couple of my favorite theologians. Thomas Long is one of them. And he said, of the book of Hebrews, he said, <coughs> excuse me, among the books of the New Testament, the epistle of Hebrews stands out as both strange and fascinating, unique in style and content, a piece of literature that is simply unlike any of the other epistles, despite the fact that some of the phrases are among the best known and most quoted in the New Testament, it often stands as obscure. One of my favorite professors at seminary, Dr. Hal Tossig, who taught at Union Theological Seminary for most of his career, but taught at Phillips just one semester when Dr. Smith got sick, said the creative metaphors for the life of Jesus in the letter of Hebrews are some of the most imaginative of any book in the New Testament. It has been considered an obscure work and does not fit well with conventional Christianity. That's an interesting way to put that, but it's true. It extensively reworks the Hebrew scripture, combining it with Greek philosophy, introducing an entirely new concept of Jesus simultaneously as priest and sacrifice. But it is clear that with the special attention paid to both Jerusalem, the temple, or all three, the Jerusalem, the temple, and the Hebrew scriptures, that the author had a deep abiding knowledge of Israel and its tradition. And he goes on to write that like the letter of Peter to Philip and the revelation of John, this book was written to people who faced persistent persecution and difficulty. is challenging. It challenges us with every word, with every deed. It challenges us to look back and look forward simultaneously. Verse 13 is actually a part of the, the narrative that's above the, the second part of our text. And it, according to Dr. Long, it was probably part of a sermon. Or at least it reads that way. And that is intriguing. But it is also a call to faith. A call to who God is, who Jesus is. A call to make our lives holy. In spite of the fact that we fall short over and over again. As I was reading this text, I began to remember what may be the greatest illusion of all time, and that is that we are in control. We like to be in control. We like to think we're in control. We like to think that the things we do wrong go unnoticed. In fact, one of my favorite modern sayings is, is that if I don't get caught, I must not have done anything wrong. Uh -huh. Now, I will be perfectly frank. When I drive to Oklahoma City, I might exceed the speed limit a little bit. And if I don't get caught speeding, did I really break the law? I did, as a matter of fact. But we are dealing with something a little different. Human perception is different than the perception we're talking about today. We can get away with statements like that with our brothers and sisters here on this planet. We can say, hey, I didn't get caught. I must not have done anything wrong. And everybody goes, yep, 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 that's right. But God's perception is vastly different. One we can scarcely even grab a hold of or glimpse. We are dealing with a God who knows us better than we know ourselves. 
and loves us anyway. God takes an ordinary life and calls it to holiness. God takes a crisis or hardship and makes it the backdrop for which the glory of God is poured out and through. God, through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, are constantly calling us to redemption, constantly redeeming us. We are not done. You've heard me say this before, that God is not done with us, that we are works in progress, that God is still redeeming, molding, stretching, and growing us. This may be the hardest part for us to understand. Because it's really comfortable to say, I'm done. I'm finished. God is done with me. I don't think it works like that. Maybe. Maybe, just maybe, when we hear the words, well done. Maybe then God's done with us, but I'm not even convinced of that. The lesson, though, is that we cannot hide. God sees us just as we are, warts and all, brokenness and all, weakness and all, flaws and all. And God loves us anyway. God continues to speak to us, still loves us enough to continue to forgive our indifference, our sin, our hatred, our ignorance, our stiff neck and wandering hearts, as the Bible says. God loves us anyway and is always trying to draw us into deeper relationship, more meaningful relationship, and has sent us the Holy Spirit that it may always nurture us and draw us in. I can't remember whether it was Thursday afternoon or Friday when I was playing with this I play with my sermon in the back of my head all day long and every day until I stand before you. In fact, Sharon would probably tell you it's different than it was in the 815 service. But that's okay because God's not done. But I was reminded as I was playing with this on Thursday afternoon, I know that sounds flippant and I don't mean it that way. God is always teasing me out, teasing out the topic that God has laid on my heart. And I was reminded of the story of Adam and Eve. They ate of the fruit, the Word tells us. In other words, they had sinned. I have no idea if it was an actual piece of fruit or not. I don't know. I don't care. It doesn't matter. They sinned in the eyes of God, just like we have. And the very first thing they did, after putting on leaves, was to hide from God. I want you to think about that for a minute. They didn't say, wow, I messed up. Or God, I'm sorry. They tried to hide from the very being that created everything from where they stood. That the Bible tells us walked in the garden with them daily. They tried to hide. go back to that story with the little little being sitting on our shoulder. How do we hide from a God that knows us better than we know ourselves? Adam and Eve tried. God even gave them the illusion that they were succeeding when he called out to them. We God already knows every wrong we have committed, every wrong we will commit, every word we will say, the Scripture says. And God knows them before they even leave our tongue. And yet, God loves us anyway. We don't need to hide. 
We don't need to hide who and what we are. We must seek God's forgiveness. We must seek God's presence. But hiding doesn't even enter into the equation. But that hard lesson, we must embrace that God knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves and loves us anyway. As I said a little bit ago, God knows our, each and every one of our flaws, weaknesses, and sent Jesus that we might be redeemed. That's the good news, folks. That is the good news. Would you pray with me? God, we're grateful. Grateful for your love. Grateful for your steadfast love. We can do nothing to earn it. We can do nothing to deserve it. You grant it to us as a gift. And we cannot hide from you. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for loving us in spite of ourselves. May we truly walk in the newness of life in the freedom of Christ Jesus. Safe, secure in the knowledge that you love us, that you have forgiven us, that you have redeemed us in spite of everything else. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Thank you. Thank you.